Welcome to the Opportunity Podcast, where entrepreneurs come to learn from real buyers, sellers, and industry experts on the lesser known growth opportunities to build their online business empires. We'll uncover tactics veteran online business entrepreneurs have used to build, buy, flip, and sell their way towards personal wealth. Sit back, grab a coffee, and get ready to uncover hidden growth secrets. The Opportunity Podcast starts now. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Opportunity Podcast, your go-to resource for hidden growth opportunities throughout online business. For those familiar new to the podcast, I'm Sarah and thanks for joining me today. In this episode, we have Kate All, founder of Simple Pin Media, a marketing agency that creates personalized Pinterest marketing strategies for online businesses. Kate is also the host of the Simple Pin Podcast, one of the top Pinterest-focused podcasts boasting over a million downloads. In this episode, Kate sets the record straight on Pinterest. It's not a social media platform. It's a search and discovery network. With years of experience behind her helping businesses leverage Pinterest to its fullest potential, she lays out the ways anyone can generate leads for their business, expand their brand presence, and transform their business through the power of Pinterest. If you feel like you've been missing a trick with your Pinterest marketing, this is the episode for you. Let's dive in and see what Kate has to share. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Opportunity Podcast. I am so excited to be joined today by Kate All from Simple Pin Media. So Kate, how are you doing today? I'm so great and I'm excited to chat with you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm so excited. We already started chatting prior to the call. It got to the point where it's like, you know what, we just need to hit record because <laughs> yeah. like we're already having too much fun. But that's awesome. So Kate, talked a little bit about your backstory. I think you've got an amazing backstory and I want to make sure we share it with the audience. So walk me through, how did you make your way into the crazy world of Pinterest? Yeah. So back in 2010, a friend had asked me to work on her Facebook page. It was really when the business pages really started to explode on Facebook. And I thought, okay, I'll try it out. And I realized I loved this whole I don't know if you want to call it the game, but really like the engagement game of getting, drawing people out and getting them to see what we were posting. And that really turned into me working on her website. And she had a frugal and deal blog. And that was really big then because we were coming out of the recession or we were still in it actually. So I loved this whole affiliate marketing strategy piece, kind of a jack of all trades for her website. And I really learned from her all about WordPress sites And we started to dabble in Pinterest because we had heard rumblings of just it being a good traffic driver. But in 2010 was when Pinterest had started and you know Facebook was before that. So people were kind of like, what is Pinterest? I got on there within the first year, invite only. And I went on and I was like, I don't get it. This doesn't even make (laughs) sense to me. But I so wanted the invitation because who doesn't want to be left out? Of course. So fast forward to 2013, my family had experienced a lot of the repercussions of the recession. My husband couldn't find a job. We were a family of five living on food stamps. And the income that I was getting from her just was not cutting it. So unemployment was about to stop. And she had just been watching a Pinterest marketing webinar, which was really new on the scene. And she was like, you know, you've been doing this and we've been working at this. You should manage people's Pinterest accounts. And I was like, that is such a dumb idea. Nobody is going to go for that. And to her credit, she was like, well, actually, you don't have any other plans and you don't have any money. So I think you should do this. And I was like, (laughs) all right. So right about that same time, Facebook had changed its business pages. So it became this perfect storm of nobody was getting traffic anymore from Facebook. And now they needed to figure out where to get traffic and people were starting to get it from Pinterest. So I spent the next three months researching everything I could about Pinterest, about how to manage for people's accounts, what the analytics were. And in 2014, I bought the domain Simple Pin Media. I got a very, very like boring website that just had three service packages and told them like, hey, you're beta. Let's try this and see if it works. But if it doesn't, we'll just not tell anybody about it. And they loved it. They were like, this is so awesome. I'm going to tell my friends. And then eight years later, here I am still doing Pinterest. We have over 100 clients that we work with in the paid and the organic space and then a whole education wing of the company. So 
I went from sitting at a kitchen table to a full-fledged company in eight years. Absolutely incredible. I mean, I know that you've done amazing things with Simple Pen and where you've gotten it to today. I mean, like personally, at what point did you start to believe in this and start to think it was going somewhere? Because, you know, you went from, I don't see how this is going to work. Everyone is starting to turn to me and ask for this. I mean, like, how did you just go from point one to all of a sudden this thing is taking off? Like, this is the thing I've been waiting for. Yeah, it was a really crazy process. It was that first year. I will say, like, I had a lot of referrals and my daughter got super sick about nine months in and she was diagnosed with type one diabetes. And I was sitting actually in the hospital and I thought, I need a number two. And that was probably like the first like crack of the door. And then a couple months later, after I had trained her, I got a really big recommendation from somebody in our industry and my email started to like blow up with people asking if I would manage for them. And I think it was really that moment where I had to make a decision, like, is this going to be a side hustle just to get us through and keep our heads above water? Or am I really going to lean into this as a business? And I decided to lean into it as a business and I hired a business coach at that time because I knew I didn't know how to grow a company. I have a degree in political science and I had plans to be a teacher. So this idea of entrepreneurship and business ownership was not in my wheelhouse. So I think it was probably almost a full year after I bought the domain that we started to go, oh, we've got a company on our hands. Let's do this. Oh, amazing. I love that story. You're obviously going through so much at the time and you had to make that choice of do I invest in myself and look at myself as an entrepreneur? This thing that accidentally got traction, is that what I am now? I think we have a lot of people in our network that kind of do the same. You know, We're dealing more with businesses that get to the point, oh, I didn't even realize I was a business that was worth selling. I didn't realize I was an asset. But there's loads of accidental entrepreneurs that come our way that I think have a similar story to you. And one of the reasons I'm just so pumped to have you on and to pick your brain all about Pinterest is, you know, In our world, uh, we have content-based businesses that crush it on Pinterest and they become these six-figure, seven-figure businesses because of how successful they are on Pinterest. However, I say that with the caveat of, I think there's a lot of people out there that don't get Pinterest, something you and I were talking about and totally gelling on. But I wanted to set the scene because I think people are going to see this and they might see this podcast and some people are going to go, sweet, Pinterest, love it, know it. And then we've got kind of everyone out there going, I've never understood that one. (laughs) So, you know, many people, they view Pinterest, they just think social media platform, but you have had a different view. You know, you've previously said that Pinterest is very much like Google. It's not a social media platform. It's a search and discovery network. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. So we go to the nature of how people use Pinterest, which is very much a user habit is the same as Google. So they're going with this idea of a question or a need, and they're putting in something into the search bar and hoping to look for results. So that's why we move it away from social media, because social media is very much about, I want to learn about your life. I want to get lost in your life. I want to hear your story. And Pinterest users really don't care about that. They care about themselves. So we take how a user approaches. And that's why we call it similar to Google or even similar to YouTube, where there is that search intent. And a lot of people on Pinterest, they don't want the conversation. They don't want the Facebook threads or the Instagram, you know, whatever it is, like they just don't want that. They want the thing that says, how do I find my dreams? How do I reach my goals? What are the products that I love? And then what are the articles that I want to read without the noise? So they're going to discover something. They are not going to interact and be social. Absolutely. I know as we're talking about that, I guess in the same vein here, niching down to like traditional SEOs, I'm sure that you've run into them. And I think there's always like a, let's say an unspoken war, (laughs) or maybe just everyone stays in their own camps, but we've got traditional SEOs on that one side. And they may hear what you just said about, you know, it acting like Google and be like, no way, Mm. you know, I don't see the overlap. I just don't get it. I mean, how would you address people like that who are just say naysayers of Pinterest and How would you come back around to them to say, to highlight Pinterest value? Yeah. Well, like we were talking about before, I think mostly I get that from men. You know, Google is 
different where people really want to get straight to the answer, want to make it work, get the results. And I will admit that when it comes to SEO and Google, it can happen quicker than it does on Pinterest. And I think that's a little bit because the Pinterest user takes about three to six months to truly make a decision on a lot of things. They save a lot of things for later. That's the beauty of all the boards and the way that you can organize Pinterest. Whereas people who use Google, they are looking for an instant answer. So again, you have to look at how they are so different and say, who's my person on Pinterest? Are they there? I think that's number one. And then what are they looking for? And how do I get in front of them? And knowing that between the search habits and then how Pinterest SEO works, it's going to take time. So we tend to find people who approach the platform impatient. So the traditional SEOs go in there and they're like, okay, I want results. I want it now. Let's go. Right. And it really doesn't work that way. It's definitely the long tail. You're going to have to invest six to nine months into it to really see movement. But even more important than that, you really have to make sure that your ideal customer is on there. And the example that I tell people a lot is, you know, TikTok is all the rage right now. Everybody is like, got to get on TikTok, whatever. I am not on TikTok because I know that my people really aren't on there. They are in a different place. They are Googling. They are Some of them are on Pinterest and then Instagram. So it's this different ecosystem that I have to use to engage with people in different ways. So I understand their frustration with not understanding Pinterest or not seeing its value because it's not very quick. And it doesn't feel good. I mean, that's a really important thing to bring up is that all these other platforms have instant gratification or they have a like or they have an engagement metric. Pinterest doesn't have that. So there's these times where you feel like, is my effort actually working? And so I think there's just so many more barriers to Pinterest, but I would say it's a good supplement to what you're doing on Google. And I can tell you with all the clients that we've ever worked with, the top two are always Google and Pinterest. That's it. Every single time you have those two powerhouses that you see in analytics driving traffic to their website. And that's how you continue to generate growth with those two side by side working together. Gosh, she's just said so many things that I'm like thinking, yes, this, that. (laughs) I mean, a couple things that just came to mind as you said that, you know, you've got clients that are killing it on you know Pinterest and Google at the same time. I've seen the back ends of the sites that sell with us, and it's the same deal. You know, it's impressive how many content businesses manage to do both, and how important it was for them to have both. But you know, we are always telling you know our content based sellers, it's like, look, you know, make sure to build a moat around your business. Don't have just one form of traffic. And so it's always so funny to me that. SEOs who are always striving to, you know, rank for things and get traffic for their businesses. And, you know, they'll talk about the value of, say, ads and other things to, you know, create diversity in their businesses. Just it doesn't make sense to me that they don't go, of course, Pinterest is a natural extension. It would be so fantastic for my business. Why would I not pursue it? But I think it's back to what you said. And it's funny how, you know, many SEOs, they'll come on this show, for example, and say, there's an art and a science to SEO. However, I think Pinterest, it does kind of require that artistry. It requires that open-mindedness and the patientness that I think, you know, some people say they understand an SEO, but it sounds like your experience has been a little bit different. I think you've maybe met some of the people that are like hardline, like, no, yeah, if I can't rank for it next week, it's not viable, you know, something like that. But yeah, it's just fascinating to me that the way that you've laid that out and to me sort of hearing that and having experienced it myself talking to SEOs that are just like kind of staunchly anti-Pinterest. I think you've just put it together beautifully as to why it's like, you shouldn't be that way. You can't be that way. You're just too similar. (laughs) Yes, totally. Hit the nail on the head. Yeah. You know, thinking about how long you've been in the industry, I think 2014 is about when you got started, you said. I'm sure you've seen Pinterest change and evolve over the years. I would love a picture of that from your perspective. Oh, it's been so interesting. I was joking with somebody the other day. I feel like a Pinterest historian a little bit because I can see the lineage of how it has changed. And one of the biggest things I think has been that we've seen most platforms move from this chronological algorithm to a smart feed algorithm. And that was Pinterest's big change first was to move from chronological to what they call a smart feed. 
And the hope with this has been that they will be, again, more like Google to where if I come onto Pinterest, they will know my interests. They will know who I'm following. They will know what my future interests can be based on my habits. And so this has been a thread in a vein that still continues to this day. But they've also added in, of course, ads because they need to make money. And that was probably about 2014, 2015. Those have been evolving too as well. And then Pinterest went public in 2019, which again changed a lot of the dynamics. And now Pinterest is trying to capture the short form story idea pin thing like you see on TikTok and Instagram as our world has moved so much to ingest this short form. But I think Pinterest had a challenge because of its ecosystem to really continue to invest in ideas as opposed to people's stories, because a Pinterest user doesn't want your story. They want to know what your idea is, what your tips are, how you're going to walk them through something. And so Pinterest has to be, well, it is the outlier, but it has to capture some of that, I guess, culture, if you will, and the way that we're moving. And then also keep people on the platform because the ecosystem had people moving off. And if you're a company that is public and you're trying to continue to make money, you need advertisers to spend money on your platform. And the way you get them to do that is by showing, look how long people stick around. And that's very different for something like an Instagram or Facebook. So I think Pinterest overall has made this change, especially to where we are now, to iterate itself into how it can both serve the current cultural landscape and its own people. And I think we're in that tension right now for Pinterest. There's a lot of talk about Pinterest 2.0, what that looks like, what they're changing into. And I see it, we're in this weird, like delicate dance phase of, all right, how are we going to navigate this and not turn into another Instagram? And just recently, Pinterest has said, we want to continue to be media, not social. So they're kind of threading the needle there, but it's going to be interesting to see what we see on the other side in 2022. Yeah, you know, we'll get into this in a bit because I want to talk to you about social commerce and buying intent on Pinterest. And I think there's a linchpin there. But I think when you were just talking about, okay, there's a delicate dance happening. We don't quite know what Pinterest 2.0 is. I'm still curious, let's say in today's environment, what does it take to be successful? And what are the kind of trends that are, say, driving the Pinterest ecosystem that, you know, would allow someone to really kind of make it? Right. I think one of the interesting things about where we're at is before you could just pin a pin. So we call these static pins. So you just put a pin on Pinterest, you would keyword it because it's, again, search and discovery. And you would put it onto Pinterest and you could pin it to other boards too, but you just had this one pin. Well, now we have the integration of video and then we have the integration of these new idea pins. So in order to be successful on Pinterest today, there has to be this diversification strategy of your content. So you're writing your content on your website, but how you distribute it onto Pinterest has to be a static pin. If you can do a really short form video, that's great. And then if you can do what's called the idea pin, these are all things that we're telling people now you have to try to do because the algorithm is favoring these new idea pins, they're favoring video, and then they're looking at what their users are interacting with. Now, what's interesting about that is Pinterest can say, hey, marketers, they call them creators, we want you to do this. But the pinner, the people who use the Pinterest really have to adopt to it. And we are in this tension where pinners don't really like idea pins because they don't link. Pinterest has been seen as I can click on a static pin and I can go to find out more. And so we're hearing these rumblings from pinners going, why can't I have my link? And then at the same time, we're hearing from Pinterest, oh, pinners don't really like a link. They like to create content on the platform. And a little bit of that is trying to attract this Gen Z crowd. But the primary users really are millennial and even Gen X. And, you know, frankly, my mom uses it all the time as a boomer. So it's very interesting that you have this multi-generational use. But Pinterest is really pushing for this Gen Z kind of use of the platform. So I say all that to say what it takes to be successful right now is a whole lot of patience, a whole lot of willingness to kind of weather this new iteration. And then number three, this diversity of the type of content you're putting on Pinterest with the consistent thread of keywords, because people still do search. And we just don't know what the algorithm is doing right now as far as distributing out this new 
content. So a lot of our clients that we see are successful, number one, they're creating new content. That I cannot stress that enough that we get websites who come to us who they've kind of been on autopilot for maybe a a year, some even longer, and they've been kind of riding the old wave of Pinterest. Their traffic is just taking a nosedive. And then we have these other people who are consistently creating new content, probably about once a week, they're successful because they're actually putting new stuff on the platform. The platform's kind of like craving anything new because they have all this older stuff on there too, because people repin. That's what the pinner does. They save all these great ideas they find. So it's a little bit of trying to be consistent in your content creation. And sometimes that's really hard for people. They're exhausted, they're tired, and they just want their website to get all this traffic from Pinterest. But that's really not the way that it's working anymore. So embracing all these new formats and diversification, and then creating content at least once a week. Well, it makes me think of an earlier point you made about how Pinterest doesn't have the immediate gratification, you know, say all the stats you might be used to on another platform. So of course, it makes people less inclined to start posting on there because they can't see the traction until, you know, you get more of it. And then you go back and then you look at your website's analytics and then you're like, oh, just kidding. Uh, (laughs) That was a good use of my time. Exactly. You were talking about Gen Z. And so, you know, that comes to mind as there's been just this wave of conversation around social commerce, for example. And so that, you know, we were just talking this week about, you know, Shopify and TikTok creating opportunities, you know, all of a sudden TikTok becomes this new buying platform. And I think there's just this buzz thinking about Gen Z, how do they buy, you know, they want to buy in new ways. I understand why Pinterest is trying to do what they're doing, but I guess back to like, certainly if we're demonstrating Pinterest value, talk to me about buying intent on Pinterest. You know, how has there always been a kind of a level of buying intent, say, I'm sure that people might have missed. And how could, well, I say online sellers, I'm thinking like online business owners or even corporate giants that are lean into this platform for its buying power. Yes. This is a huge one for Pinterest. So in 2020, when COVID hit, Pinterest just exploded and it exploded on all levels between recipes and products and finding ideas and it doubled its user base. And, you know, what it had all of a sudden was, oh, we've got all these people. We've got to really lean into how we serve them. And that turned into really leveling up their e-commerce tools. And so they came out later that year with the Verified Merchant Program. And this was definitely integrated with Shopify. So they wanted to make shopping really easy on the platform, but they didn't want to have the checkout on the platform. So Pinterest has been pretty clear about this, but we're hearing rumblings that they are testing out a buy button on the platform, but it long ways off. So Pinterest wants to make your shop really easy to be on Pinterest because the Pinterest user, the buying life cycle is about three months. So Pinterest knows that it's the great informer of a purchase, but it hasn't been the great, I guess, originator of that purchase. They want to be that. They want to be both the informer and the action taker. So they created this verified merchant program, and then they created this ability to upload your catalog so that your prices could be updated. That was a really big thing that sellers were running into was, what if I run out of stock? What if my pricing changes? And so Pinterest said, we're going to help you create product pins. And these product pins will have all this rich pin data that has your current information on it current pricing, and they refresh every single day, and they'll update. And that was huge because when you pin a pin on Pinterest, and then somebody else pins it, and it goes out into the ecosystem, it's there forever. You can't change it. So you make a typo on your image, well, out of luck. And if it goes viral, you're just going to be stuck with a image that has something spelled wrong. But when it came to shop owners, they were like, we can't afford that because if something does go viral, I'm out of stock or my price has changed, I'm going to get this bad reputation or I'm going to get people emailing me frustrated. So Pinterest integrated these features and is still integrating them. I would say they still want to get better and better for online sellers because the Pinterest user, they gather all of their ideas. So let's say I'm going to you know, in the home and design space, Pinterest is huge. So let's say I'm going to put in a new sink in my kitchen and I search on Pinterest for the specific type of sinks. I'm saving to my board 25 or 30 
about three months before I actually need that kitchen sink. Might even be longer now because we have, you know, the supply chain problems. So then when I'm ready to purchase or when I go to meet with my designer, I'm going to pull up my Pinterest board and I'm going to say, I want that one. Let's go figure out how to buy it. So that's going to take people to the website to make the purchase. So we tell sellers that people aren't ready to buy immediately, but Pinterest is informing them of the purchase. And I'll tell this, this is a funny story and experience in my life is I was on Pinterest and I saw this ad for this thing called a solo stove. I don't know if you've heard of these. They're Mm -hmm. magical, (laughs) but it's a smokeless outdoor fire pit. And I hate smoke around a fire pit. It drives me crazy. So I followed this ad and number one, their ad was broken. It didn't even take me to the right page. So that's a bummer for them. But number two, I told somebody about it. I was like, I was on Pinterest and I saw this amazing stove and I'm trying to figure out where I can buy it. And it said it was available at like REI, I went to REI. And then finally, my friend said, I saw this in Costco. And so I was like, no way. So I drove to Costco. I bought this stove. Love it. Everybody who comes to our house, we've now, I think we've sold probably six or seven stoves since then. I bought one for my dad. And what's interesting is that was all off of a Pinterest ad. And it doesn't have to be an ad on Pinterest. But what that illustrates is that I didn't take action on that specific pin, but informed me of my future purchase and I was driven to go find it. So that's the power that Pinterest drives is this aha moment and this discovery moment that is like, oh, that's an option. I can buy that or that's a really cool product. I'm going to save that for later. So if sellers want to cast a wider net And I could go on and on with like multiple stories, but I won't hear. But I'll just say casting a wider net or getting cold leads, Pinterest is the place to do it. And that's very much different than Instagram, where it might be people who are warmer to you. You know, as you talk about that, all I can think of is if Pinterest gets a buy now button, I'm doomed. (laughs) I feel like they did have one. They tested it out for a year and it failed miserably because... Pinterest users aren't ready to purchase right away. They're cold. They're like, we joke the tire kickers of like a used car. They're like, I just got to test this out for a little while. I'm not sure I'm going to buy from you yet. But when they click in, they're ready and they want it. Like me with my solo stove. It's like, I'm going to do whatever I can to get this product. So I think that the buy button, I don't know if they test it again, it'll be different, of course. But I just don't know if Pinterest users are ready to take action that quickly. Yeah. I mean, I think about, say, me personally. And one, I almost can't be on Pinterest that often because I'll just disappear into the void. That is the black hole. The black hole that is all of a sudden I'm reinventing my identity and like creating a house that I don't have and just all of the things. It's it's an uncontrollable. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think, yeah, the last time I got on it, I was like, ooh, all right. This was so much fun, but you need to like take a walk. It's something that just came to my mind as you were talking about the complexities. First off, this relationship between people on Pinterest, say business owners who are trying to, you know, talk about their products and Pinterest, you know, they're coming to them with like, well, you know, but I don't want to sell out and I don't want to this is that's fascinating to me because on the other side, we deal with a lot of like Amazon sellers who are dealing with this giant who could probably more or less, they just don't care. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah, it's like, cool. Yeah. I don't care if you sell out and like, you know, you're lucky that we give you this platform to talk about your product and sell. Just as you were talking about that, it was just so interesting, one, to have this platform listen and try to work in with what these small business owners need. I'm curious, it's kind of something that came to mind. Is there an established relationship between Amazon sellers and Pinterest, like, do you get a lot of people who come to you that are Amazon sellers who are trying to use Pinterest to leverage their businesses? Or is that maybe not something you see as often? No, we've had quite a few, actually. We had one who we worked with them for about a year. They only had an Amazon store. And for them, what was interesting is we had to kind of create all the Pinterest images to direct to the Amazon store. But what we're seeing is that People aren't quick, again, back to that thing, like they're not ready to go to Amazon to purchase. So it's kind of like, whoa, you just like, hold on a minute. Like, I'm not ready. So with the Amazon store, it's best if it leads to a website that talks about the content or the product. And then at the end, 
the lead to the Amazon listing is the solution. And that's most often how you find that buyer's journey. And we've even had somebody have a website with a lot of like reviews that link to Amazon, you know, and products like the 10 best, you know, hair dryers or whatever. Even then, it was a little bit tougher because people were looking for solutions like, what's a hairdryer that's not going to break my hair? Not like the 10 best hairdryers or whatever. So I think it just depends on the approach. But I definitely think there's space for Amazon sellers. It's just you have to be willing to put in a content strategy. And a lot of sellers, from our experience, that's a very frustrating part because it feels like they don't want to blog at all. They're like, I just want you to buy my product. It's like, well, Pinterest users aren't your people then. Yeah. No, that's such a great point. I think we see it all the time. Business owners, and there's just a completely different parts of their trajectory to grow their business. And you get full-fledged Amazon businesses that have developed brands, which is, you know, the kind of leading advice if you want to be successful on Amazon, build a brand, which means you probably have to build said brand off of Amazon. But you know, you get all kinds of people who are somewhere in that who struggle with it, don't get it. It's like, oh, I just need to stay on Amazon. And I don't understand if I have a website, what I would do with it beyond just leading back to my listings, whatever. And so I think if anything, what you've just said probably saves some people hardship. It just goes back to your earlier point of like, know your market, know your buyer, how they want to buy. You know, if Pinterest isn't for you, okay, but there are actually ways for it to make it work for you. You just need to be in the mindset of building a brand. If you're not in the mindset of building a brand, maybe not. (laughs) Maybe move along. Yeah. Yeah. And also like, you know, reconsider because you're not going to make it on Amazon nowadays (laughs) without a brand. No, but I agree. That uh, kind of makes me think of my next question here because, and again, I feel like we're in this delicate dance of back and forth of say naysayers and pro Pinterest, but you know, we know Pinterest, it's a visual medium. And I think there are plenty of business owners out there who go, I'm not visual. It's not for me. And so I was wondering, you know, how would you approach that? Would you say Pinterest truly is more suited for certain business models or niches? Or can it be a successful marketing strategy for any kind of business? Yeah, I would definitely always tell people that if you lean into more of like the local space, if you're, you know, brick and mortar and you have no online presence or just even a little bit of online presence, don't use Pinterest. Or even if you are, you know, our experience with just being, you know, we just talked about the Amazon seller or the seller that doesn't really want to do a whole lot of investment into nurturing, and they really do just want the immediate kind of buy. Pinterest might, again, might not be it. You could do ads on Pinterest if you have a really great ad strategy and you're hitting them where you're at. You don't need a big organic presence on Pinterest. Utilize ads. So I would say those pieces, I would probably discourage people from leaning into Pinterest. But if you want this diversification of trying to find, well, let me back up. I always tell people, think about your ideal person. Like, where do they hang out? What do they read? What websites do they visit? And if any of those have any kind of relation to Pinterest, or you think they could be on there, then you definitely should lean into it. We had somebody... This is such a great story. It's probably three years ago, four years ago. I had this guy come to me and he was like, I really want to try Pinterest because I want to get out in front of my competitors. And I was like, okay, well, tell me about your ideal audience. He's like, it's men, 55 to 65, only interested in investing. And I was like, I need to be honest with you. Your people are not there. Yeah. <laughs> and he was like, but I just want to try. And I was like, I'm totally fine if you just want to try But I need you to understand that you might try and what you're going to attract is possibly women 35 to 55 who are interested in investing because maybe they've never done it before. Do you want them? He's like, "Mm, not really. I was like, okay, then it might not be. And he's like, I just want to try it. I'm like, okay, as long as we're all on the same page and you know it might not work. And it didn't. And we were very honest with that after four to six months to say, you are really not getting your ideal people because they are not on there. They're just not. If they're in the construction industry, in the design industry, for sure, they are on there, but not in the investing space. So that's just a quick example of knowing exactly who your people are, looking at the demographics of Pinterest, and trying to get those aligned to see if, you know, is your person over there? Great. If they're not, let's choose LinkedIn. (laughs) 
just always hop over to LinkedIn. There's yeah. someone out there. <laughs> someone <laughs> someone all engaged with you over there. Yeah. <laughs> I know that's such an interesting story. You can't be always got to know like who is your audience. Don't go making you want to say brash moves, but it happens all the time. You know, we'll get people who are like. I'm going to come up with this crazy SEO strategy and then they just have no idea how to implement said crazy SEO strategy and end up doing damage. Or I'm going to launch a lot of products on Amazon and see if it sticks. And it's like, well, you should have just gone back to building a brand. I mean, it seems like no matter where you go, everybody's desire to grow, usually without a strategy in place, is there, it's happening, it's hurting them. And it's just like, okay, take a step back. I think for those listening out there who are hearing this and like, great, I'm excited about this. I want to know how to get started on Pinterest. What would be the first steps to, say, start a successful Pinterest marketing strategy? And how do you scale it from those beginning steps? Yeah. So I would say one of the biggest things is to do that research piece of are your people on Pinterest? And that can simply be done by picking up your phone, getting the app, you know, checking it out, searching your particular products or niche and to see what's there. And if you end up searching and you find something that is completely unrelated to what it is your business is, that's probably a good indication that Pinterest users either see your business different or it's just not there. So we tell people start there. And that's also a really important point as well is you can't really be a good marketer on a platform if you don't use it. So I always joke, I think, you know, to our point about LinkedIn People always tell me, go use LinkedIn. I'm like, I hate LinkedIn. I don't even (laughs) understand it. All I want to do is mess with all the people who have left hilarious DMs in my, you know, to pitch me and they get it wrong every time or they have typos. (laughs) That's the fun part of LinkedIn for me, but I don't really know how to use it. And I don't feel like I can lean into it because I don't understand it. And that creates a barrier for us, unless I'm going to hire somebody, right? But if you're doing this on your own, that lack of understanding creates a barrier to connect with your end user. So pick up your phone, look at Pinterest on the app. There's a lot of new things. In fact, they're leaning into Pinterest TV. That's a big one. And just look and see, are my people here? So that's number one. Number two, if you find out that they are, make sure that your profile, your Pinterest page, and describes who you are and what you do. That right at the top, I can easily understand what your business name is. You can add a description. You can add an image of you. That's really just going to take you 10 minutes, if that. And then you create boards. And these boards are really the key to helping people find you. And you want to name them very simply. Don't go cute, but you want to go very specific. If you do, let's say you are a seller and you're selling a specific type of women's jewelry, You want to be very specific with that women's sterling silver bracelets. You don't want to be just like women's jewelry. That can mean 75 different things to all these people on the platform. So getting at least five boards, naming them exactly what it is you do or you talk about, and then you go to your image strategy. And your image strategy for Pinterest is different than everywhere else, of course. It's a vertical image and everywhere else uses horizontal But you can use Canva. We tell people to start playing around with this idea of your image is your billboard strategy. It's your people are thumbing by on the platform and your image catches their eye or your video catches their eye. And that's why really I suggest being on the platform to see what you like and then recreate that. I love Instagram. I'm addicted to it probably. Well, I know I am. I have to like set strong (laughs) limits around it. But as a result of knowing the platform, I know what I like and what I don't like. So then when I take that into my marketing, I'm very clear to say, well, I'm definitely not starting a video this way because that I don't like how that person does that. Or I'm definitely doing this because I like how that person does this. So when you get to your images, it's all about capturing attention and making sure people understand what they're going to click on when they get to your website. So these stages that I just walked through, the setting up stage is about an hour. And then this image creation can be the longest part. And if you are not good at image creation, hire it out. I am horrible at creating Pinterest images. Like I'm real bad at it. And so I have to ask somebody to help me bring my vision to life because I literally could spend three hours creating a Pinterest image in Canva, and that's no good use of my time at all. So I hire that out, and then I start to get into this 
kind of the wheel beginning to turn a little bit. This is like the little engine that could have Pinterest. It's kind of like just starting and then pinning that to boards that closely match what the topic is. And this is the same for every type of business, regardless of size. This is always what we're going to tell people to do is you have to have a fully set up profile. And then you have to have at least, we would tell people 20 to 30 images to start and some pieces of content. If somebody comes to us, let's say they sell a t-shirt and they just have one option, maybe two, we're probably going to tell them, you know what, we want you to work on either building up your stock or building up a lot of different images that lead to a lot of different places on your website because you're not ready to sustain a daily strategy of like even three to five pins going out per day because you just don't have anything. So you would want to kind of pump the brakes a little bit until you built up your content stockpile. Such an interesting holistic strategy, what you were just saying there. It's so great to listen to you go through that because you know it's not every day we get Pinterest experts onto the show. So this is pretty exciting. You know, one thing that came to my mind as you're going through all those first steps and setting up the strategy, to me, I'm like, okay, does that shift at a certain point? Or does that shift when you are say a very large business, a startup at seven figure business, maybe you're new, maybe you're mirror on Pinterest, but how does that change depending on the size of the business? Would the fundamentals be the same for you know businesses of a large size? Yeah, great question. So we distinguish them between strategy and tactics. So we look at strategy as the why behind why you're using Pinterest. And so my strategy for using Pinterest is to grow my email list. I don't have ads on my website. We do some affiliate marketing, but it's really not important. So my goal is to get those beginner Pinterest users that are asking how-to questions into my ecosystem through podcasts, through all those other pieces. So my strategy actually hasn't changed in five years, but my tactics have. And those tactics can change for both a startup and a seven-figure business based on how much content you have, and how willing you are to lean into short form video, how willing you are to lean into idea pins. Also, we have seven figure business owners who they might all of a sudden create products when they didn't have them before. They were just really in this content based model and now they've diversified. So it's all about the direction that you're going in your business based on that strategy of I still want these particular types of people, but now I'm going to leverage the verified merchant program. Now I'm going to leverage connecting my Shopify site with Pinterest and my catalog. And my images are going to look a little different for my products than they are the content. So it has to be that roadmap of changing with the platform, being a little agile, and then also being agile with your business, I guess, pathways of revenue. Because with the startup, it's really usually only one and it's not multiples. So those are the differences that we see when we work with the startups and the seven figures. It's so interesting as you say that, what came to mind, you were just mentioning, you know, linking your Shopify store. And I feel like I just had this small revelation of like, gosh, you know, Pinterest, it really can do so much good for so many different kinds of online businesses. I mean, we work with so many monetizations on our marketplace in particular. And I think we always associate Pinterest with content-based businesses, you know, affiliate websites, ad-driven websites, but it's like, you know, you've got Shopify integrations, you've got Amazon, if you're doing it right, the ability to link and grow an audience for your products there. You've got seven-figure businesses and startups able to come to Pinterest. Like, I think it's so interesting. I'm like, I don't know why it took me this long in the podcast to really put all of those together, but it's like, wow, you know, it is such a powerful tool for so many different people. I can't help but wonder how many people might be missing out. But I mean, hey, you would know quite a bit. Yeah, (laughs) you would definitely know as a person in the background working with all of those people. I'm curious, do you have any like success stories off the top of your head that somebody who came to you and just radically changed their business thanks to figuring out Pinterest? You probably have tons, but Yeah, I do actually, which is a great joy, right? To see people do this. But I think one that really stands out to me was a company came to us that Laurel Box, they do grief boxes for people. So if somebody's just lost a child or a parent or, you know, they want to send these boxes that to help process grief. 
So anyway, they had come to us just for a full build cleanup. So really just getting their Pinterest account set up and ready to go. And later I interviewed them on my podcast and they said something so fascinating about the differences between Instagram and Pinterest and how Instagram was a good connector for them. But Pinterest had led to this amazing fuel for cold leads. And it had completely grown their business because people on Pinterest were asking the question, what do I give to somebody who's just lost a child? Or what do I say to somebody who's just lost a parent? And they began to write articles answering those questions because they knew the Pinterest user was looking for those solutions. And at the end of the article, the solution was their grief box. And so all of a sudden they had two different faucets, essentially, they could turn on the Instagram faucet, and these people knew them. But now they could turn on the Pinterest faucet. And there's all these people that never knew they existed, who are becoming their customers. And now their business is growing and becoming more widely known. And especially in this subscription box, you know, era, and it completely like exploded their business in this way. And I think that's just a great example of using all the platforms in the way that they're supposed to be used instead of just going in with this idea that says, I'm going to gather up Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and LinkedIn, and we're going to approach them all the same. They were very intent to say, oh, they're different and we're going to treat them differently in order to get a different type of customer. Wow. And it's so cool to hear how they leveraged it, not just for you know, reaching the customer, but also creating the right content. I mean, it's something we hear from people all the time who have managed to quickly scale their usually content businesses with content. And it's like, well, how did you find the right content? How did you think outside of the box? And it's doing stuff like that. It's going, oh, you know what? I went to Pinterest and I actually found the keywords were the answers to my question. That's my content. And that's how I did it. And boom, look at where I am. Like, it's just always so impressive to me. Now, of course, on the other side of hearing about successful people, there's loads of people who are, they're just facing challenges when they try to go to Pinterest. What are the biggest challenges that you see people most often face? I would say right now, well, I would say for the people who have been using Pinterest for at least two to three years, right now, their biggest challenges really are, where is Pinterest going? What are they changing and iterating into? And how do I utilize the new features that they're pushing And then also look at my numbers to see what's working. And a lot of the Pinterest numbers seem to be off. We've even had a big change with Google Analytics tracking over the last year when it comes to Pinterest. So I think the challenges that we're facing right now is the data seems hard to read and it can be a guider, but it's also like, oh man, the data tells me I'm losing traffic, but this data over here tells me I'm getting engagement. How do we align those two together and continue to serve our end user? And I think the challenge is we're getting real distracted by trying to figure it out. There's a lot of people who want to figure out the game of Pinterest and the back ends and the technical pieces. And I think once you get into the weeds of that, you really get lost. Then you really become a Pinterest scientist instead of focusing back on your customer. And you have to continue to answer those questions like I just talked about, the FAQs, the main things that people are looking for, telling your story. And if you can stay in that place and kind of weather this change that we're going through with this new iteration, I think you're going to do that well. But if you get frustrated and you get so lost in it, I think you're going to move away from the whole main reason and why you're using Pinterest. So that's what we see as the biggest challenges. And also traffic has declined. I mean, I will be truthful about that in what we've seen. You know, you're not going to go back to the 2017, 2018 traffic. And even With 2020 and all the people that flooded onto Pinterest changed the platform. And so you do see traffic going down. But frankly, I don't know about you, but I kind of see traffic decreasing everywhere, you know, especially as these platforms are priming people to stay on their platforms. You know, I never leave Instagram, hardly ever. And Pinterest has been notorious for people leaving the platform, but they're changing that a little bit, which makes sense. That's they have to publicly traded company. They have to figure out how to make money to stick around. And so your traffic does look different with that push to keep them on the platform. So 
there's like seven challenges I put in there. But I think if I had to sum it all up, I would just say staying the course into why you're using Pinterest is really, really important right now. And a lot of people feel like giving up on that. No, I mean, it's fantastic advice. I mean, I know you just laid out a bunch of challenges, but there's always a flip side, right? Where it's like, okay, if you can persist, you might get X. And so I feel like X are growth opportunities. Would you say that there's, you know, particular growth opportunities that a lot of people miss out on that you want to, you know, say to people, this is a silver lining? Yeah, I would say the growth opportunity is really that diversification. Well, I'll say it's threefold. It's the mindset that Pinterest is different. The second is creating content. We see a lot of people who really are growing when they're leaning into even creating a little bit more content per week. And then number three would be this embracing of new features. So diversifying the type of pins that you have and embracing the idea pins. Those are new, you know, like 18 months ish, and they used to be called story pins and now they're called idea pins. But embracing those new features, I think, are great growth opportunities for Pinterest. Just like we see, you know, with Instagram, people who embraced Reels saw this bump of growth. When a platform introduced something new, take advantage of it because they're wanting people to adopt these new features. So they're going to show it to people. So take advantage of that new stuff and don't be afraid of it. Oh, a hundred percent. No, it's so cool. I mean, just to think back on everything you said in this podcast and talk about the changes and how it's grown and yeah, it's going to keep changing, but if you do it right, play your cards right. I mean, you can be in for some incredible growth. Well, I did want to ask, I mean, you've got such a crazy journey. I think it's really hard to juice it to a couple of questions, but I had some personal things that I would love to ask you before we sign off. So I wanted to talk to you about where you are today and the team that you've built with Simple Pin Media. So I was reading like when you started, you had specifically hired, you know, women in your community and trained them up to fill the roles that you were looking for versus just say hiring specialists and so-called experts, you know, in the industry. Why did you do that? What did you see as a potential in the women around you versus going the typical route? Right. So number one is I love people. And so I needed to see people in person. And the first person I hired was somebody who is local to my community and a good friend. And we met in person to do training. And at the time, I don't even think Zoom, I don't think was around. So there wasn't a lot of this. People were Skyping. That was pretty much it. And I didn't want to go that route. And so I wanted to be face to face. And then second, there weren't really a lot of experts in the industry at that time. I was part of a group of people who were trying to figure out Pinterest and also do some kind of VA work and service industry work at the time. But even if I wanted, it was kind of in this moment where people were trying to figure out how to use Pinterest and that translation from how to use Pinterest into being an expert just wasn't really there And you didn't want to hire somebody else because you were trying to figure it out and you didn't want to share with anybody what you were figuring out. (laughs) So I think there's probably an element too of wanting to train people up in my methods so I could allow them to flourish as I was learning as well. So those are really the two main reasons. Oh, it's so cool. I mean, it's so meaningful for me to hear because I feel like as I've gotten into this wild world of online businesses that I feel like there's this just tremendous potential and that anyone can do this and anyone can get on there and make some money. Like, I mean, it's not easy. It's not always overnight the way it's sold to people, but I love that you saw potential in the women around you and said, I want to share with them what I'm learning and what I'm seeing and, you know, let them be a part of that journey. I mean, personally, I think we need more women in the industry being able to sort of get out there and make money online just like the guys are. So I love that you went and did that and did it through Pinterest. As you said, you know, this is kind of calling back to what you said earlier in the podcast that a lot of guys in more of the SEO corners probably looked down on Pinterest and went, well, that's for the women. That's their corner and we're just not going to touch it and it's just going to be separate. And to see how you flourished, to see how Pinterest has flourished over the years and helped so many businesses, it's kind of like that nice like no, we did it. You know, like you gave us our corner, but we flourished because of it. I love what you've been able to do there. Thank you. I know that you've stayed busy with Simple Pin. I mean, we didn't talk about it much, but you also have the top Pinterest podcast, Casually. Mm-hmm. You know, 1 million downloads, no small deal. What has your podcasting journey been like? And what has it shown you about the power of the Pinterest community? 
I think podcasting has been so fun for me to be able to teach because I think I am a natural teacher, but I love the connection piece. And I think when it comes to helping the Pinterest community, I think the journey that I've been on, I'm taking them with me. And I think they go, okay, I'm going to go with you. And that lends a little bit to the longevity that's needed to be in Pinterest. And so as I've continued to invest in people in this podcasting journey, and they've been able to join me to know, okay, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. Like there's all these new changes. And I had somebody say this to me recently. Well, actually, it's been a couple of times as they've said, I feel like you make it communal, not competitive. Like there's a lot of people who have come up over the years since I started this in 2014. And they've come up and then they've left. And I wanted to be this pillar for them with this podcast to say, I'm not going to be a flash in the pan. I really am going to help you figure out Pinterest. And I think for the people trying to figure it out, there's a steadiness for them. And like the joke is I can talk people off the ledge of they're crazy, you know, because sometimes they just get so wound up about all these things. And they have told me like, you're kind of that calming voice. It's like, okay, we don't know yet, but we're going to figure it out together. And they know they can come to the podcast and hear what's the latest and how we're figuring it out together. Oh, that is so awesome. Communal, not competitive. I want more of that in the industry. I think there's too many people who built their empires from a competitive angle and not a communal angle. And it's like, the internet's big. Pinterest is big. There kind of was room for us the whole time. (laughs) Yes. Be the other way. So kind of wrapping up here, you have had such an incredible journey from this leap of faith that you've taken. I'm curious, how has your life changed since you took that leap? You started Simple Pin. You've done so many things over the years. Who are you today because you did that? Yeah, I would say I am more leader, coach, teacher, and developer than I was the years ago. I think I was doing that for myself in my own life. And now I get the opportunity to not only do that for my employees, the women who work for me, but for the women who I interact with in my community and who are, you know, learning how to use Pinterest, I get to help take those natural abilities that I think were always in there. But now they're out here and I can help really people realize their giftings and their strengths and lean into them, or I can help guide them in certain ways. So I think in that sense, I've gotten so many more opportunities to do that, which has been just, man, such a gift and something I never, ever, you know, take for granted because there's not a lot of people who get to be in leadership positions And I think there's a lot of responsibility with that leadership. And before it was just me at a kitchen table with three babies all around. And now I've got teenagers and I'm in all these places I never thought I would be, but it's just changed my life and made it richer in such a great way. That's just so incredible hearing that kitchen table to boom, (laughs) where you are today, slightly bigger babies. Yes, exactly. And a bigger business. Yep. That's so awesome, Kate. I've loved hearing about your story and getting this in-depth look at Pinterest. We tend to wrap these up with just really quick rapid fire questions if you're cool with that. Yep. Awesome. So what are best hidden growth opportunities within Pinterest? Right now it's idea pin and short form video. Awesome. And what tools or resources can help people to optimize their Pinterest marketing? Canva. Canva. Awesome. And what's been your funniest moment working with Pinterest? That's a good question. I don't know, actually. I don't know if I could do funniest. I would say funniest just really is like when Pinterest does something and it just, you shake your head a little bit like, oh, Pinterest, where are we going (laughs) with that? And you just have to laugh because Sometimes you just don't know. Pinterest one time started communities, which were supposed to be the equal to Facebook groups. That was hilarious because Pinterest is not communal at all. It's (laughs) the introverts platform. The last thing people want is communities where people talk. So that was funny and it didn't last long. (laughs) This is where I go to disappear. What are you doing to me? (laughs) Right. I do not want a community here on Pinterest at all. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's so funny. I never thought about it that way to think of all the other platforms out there that truly are social. It goes back to your earlier point, like it's not social. Stop trying to make it that way. Mm -hmm. Totally. (laughs) Awesome. Uh, Kate, this has been fantastic. 
loved hearing your story, loved hearing more about Pinterest. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with our audience. I really can't wait to hear how this helps them. I know it'll be super impactful for our listeners. So thank you so much. Yeah, you bet. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you've walked away with a bit of new insight that'll help you in your digital entrepreneurship journey. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. To learn more about businesses available for sale at Empire Flippers, click the link in the description or visit empireflippers.com slash marketplace. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.